It's three minutes past eight. Good morning. So, one of three schoolgirls who left East London in 2015 to join the Islamic State group says she has no regrets, but she wants to return to the UK. Shamima Begum, now 19, spoke to the Times from a camp in Syria. She said that she's nine months pregnant, wants to come home for the sake of her baby. Well, we can hear some of the interview right now. And let me just tell you, you may find some of what she says distressing. You're one of the best or green girls, right? Yes, I'm one of the best or green girls. We crossed the borders and we were in a house full of women um, for about a week. We realised who we were, that, that we were the three girls. And they took us to a house, uh, a man's house with his wife. And we stayed there for uh, about another week. And they didn't tell us why we were there. We kept asking his wife why we're here. We want to go to the um, house of women. We want to see our friend. And she, didn't, she didn't say anything to us. <laughs> and then afterwards, we found out that it was because they suspected we were spies. I was there for only three weeks, so after that I got married. Then you lived together in Raqqa or somewhere else? No, no. What was that like? Was that uh, an experience which fulfilled your aspirations of what it was? Yeah, it actually really did. It was like a normal life. The, the life that they show on the propaganda videos, you know, it's a normal life. But every now and then there are bombs and stuff, but other than that, no. Did you ever see executions? No, no, I never. Uh, no, but I saw a beheaded head in the bin. In the bins? Yeah, it's really What was that like when you first saw that? These are the heads of captives? Yeah. I was, didn't pay me at all. Where were you when you heard that Katija had been killed? In Naka. Do you know how she died? Her house was bombed. Because underground there was like some secret stuff going on and a spy had they, they figured out that something was going on so her house got bombed and other people got killed as well. I never thought like it would happen. I like at first I was in denial. Because I always thought if we ever did get killed we'd kill, we would get killed together. Especially I have to think about my baby as well. After my two kids died I just now I'm really overprotective of this baby. I'm scared that this baby's gonna get sick in this camp. That's why I really want to get back to Britain because I know it will be taken care of. Quite health wise at least. How is it losing two children so close to each other? You can't have been left unfazed by that. It was really, it came as a shock. It just came out of nowhere. And it was so hard. <coughs> do you think this is the end of the caliphate? Yeah, I really do. I don't have high hopes. They're just getting smaller and smaller. And there's so much oppression and corruption going on that I don't really think they deserve victory. On the one hand, the severed head unfazed you, and on the other hand, you are angry about oppression. Because it, it's one thing, because you have to remember that these people, they, the, the, their beliefs are that you kill the non-Muslim, but you treat the, the Muslims, you know, good. But now here you are. And my husband said that while he was in prison, that there were men that they would be tortured so badly that they would... They were just like, I'm just going to admit to being a spy so they can kill me. Of course. So, Dola has actually killed Muslims. You were describing mixed feelings about Dola then. Yeah. On the one hand, you don't. You said you didn't regret coming to be part of the caliphate. No, I don't regret it. But on the other hand... But when I came and I saw that there was, a pre there was like underground oppression and all this happening, it came as a shock to me, like this is actually happening. When was the last time you spoke to your mother? Um, I spoke to her when I was in Kishma. In Kishma, yeah. Just before they took Kishma, I was in Kishma. And I, I called her on the phone and I said, I want to leave. I need help. Like, if I do, if I do get to camp, I need them to be able to support me in my choice to come back to the UK. When did you last see a doctor? When I um, first came here, the cold ride was really horrible. It was really hot and stuff. So I, I took. Well, I couldn't start it started and I was bleeding so they took me to the hospital. I was in the hospital for five days and they brought me back. When is your baby due? Officially nine months. I should be giving birth any day now. Uh, Especially with this stuff situation, I will probably give birth. Well, um, Gina Vale research fellow at uh, the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation, King's College London. Good morning. Good morning. This is so interesting. Um, she's worried about her child, but she wasn't too bothered about the severed heads, was she? Mm -hmm. No. Um, she is one of the, the girls that left seemingly voluntarily um, among a peer group. And what's interesting about Shamima's case is 
that it seems that she was radicalized uh, online among her peer group with influence from um, another female recruit inside Islamic State territory. Um, and as far as we can tell, she hasn't actually engaged in violence herself, but she has on several occasions stated that she uh, empathizes with Islamic State's cause in addition to their inaction of violence. So this explains why um, she makes statements such as um, violent images or scenes do not phase her. And talking about almost the justification of killing non-Muslims, she adheres to and still believes in the purity of the ideal, that mm -hmm. form of uh, religious austerity and extremism, but she just thinks it's kind of gone wrong. That's, got, that's disturbing. Yes, and this is where we need to separate religion of, of Islam, a peaceful religion, from the extremist ideology that Islamic State is purporting and is trying to implement within their territory. What is there in, um, what, what in the Quran um, contradicts what ISIS have done? It says that they, there is no justification for killing um, unless Islamic Unless mischief has been done in the land. I'm just saying, that's what it says in that verse, it's never quoted that part. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that... You know, this isn't really the time for a theological argument. You can say there are a lot of things in scriptures, whatever the scripture, that give people justification for doing heinous things. So let's move on from the theological. Let's move on to the practical. Should she be allowed back? At the moment, it's very unclear um, what the UK government's policy on returning um, both adults and minors is. And this is the case for men, women and, uh, and children. Um, other governments have allowed um, their civilians back. Um, if proactive measures to repatriate civilians are not taken, this risks increasing uh, the burden to already overstretched facilities uh, within Iraq and Syria, whether that is uh, specialised detention centres or um, internally displaced persons or refugee camps. Um, what she describes in her interview is very poor conditions of sanitation. Um, she says that she hasn't seen a doctor um, for several weeks, even though she is nine months pregnant. Uh, so again, there are, there are many risks, not only to herself, but also security risks going forward if states do not take a proactive uh, role in facilitating their repatriation. What about the baby, some people are saying? And this is where we need to start looking at categories of minors. Um, so Shamima herself actually was a minor when she traveled. She was 15. Um, her peers were, were 15 and 16 at the time. Um, and at that age group to be traveling on their own, they made a voluntary decision based on the biased propaganda that they received. But infants such as hers that is due to be born were not in that position and therefore need to be viewed as victims, and they, they are in this position solely due to the choices made by their parents. Yes. Is that infant British? Yes. And according to the United Nations Convention for the Rights of the Child, every child has a legal right to a nationality and citizenship. And in this case, born to a British mother, that child would have the right to British citizenship. Yes. What a, a fascinating and chilling glimpse into the world of ISIS. She mm -hmm. said it was normal life most of the time, occasionally a bomb drop. She talked about the, the tortures when people thought, you know, in that paranoid fashion of totalitarian regimes and extremist regimes that there were spies amongst them. And mm -hmm. the, the, the thing she said there about her husband told her when he was being tortured and suspected of being a spy, that there were men there who were tortured so badly, they admitted to being spies, they admitted to being non-Muslims, so mm -hmm. the torture would end and they, and they would be killed. That made me feel sick when I heard it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there have been uh, many video recordings that Islamic State have published showing the execution of uh, alleged spies, uh, traitors, w either within their own ranks in some cases, um, as well as uh, foreign recruits or, or um, operatives that have gone into their territory. Um, but it's very difficult to try and establish whether that is fact or fiction. And in many cases, Islamic State will fabricate um, a lot of these alleged charges in order to create and feed into their ideology that they are being persecuted. Mm. Yes, uh, as I say, there are lots of parallels with other totalitarian and evil thug regimes. Mm -hmm. What about this? She wants to come back. And if you were cynically to be 
you know, doing her PR for her, she's not gone about it a very good way, saying, oh, I was unfazed, oh, I believe in the very principles of it, oh, I had no regrets. Sure, I mean, there are no crocodile tears, is what I'm saying. I mean, mm-hmm. Surely if she wanted to come home, she'd be saying, oh, I made a terrible mistake. I, was, I felt I was brainwashed and I was coerced and I was groomed. Please let me come home. So what do you make of what she's saying and why she's saying it and what she wants? This is actually quite unusual. Um, if you look at news reports where women in particular have been interviewed um, about their, not only their circumstances for joining the group, but also their activities whilst under the group. Um, A lot of times you have gender stereotypes in their narrative that they have been lured or coerced or taken against their will, often by a male family member. In this case, it's well known that um, Shamima and her friends travelled independently uh, from a male relative to join Islamic State in, in Iraq and Syria. So she's not able to use uh, the narrative of coercion from a gender perspective. Um, But it's interesting that she's taking taking account of of her own willingness and that she's not backing down and stating that she does no longer believe in the ideology. But she says that some of their actions have, have perturbed her from that. So what do you think will happen finally? What's your instinct on this? Will she be charged with some new laws are coming down the line on that? Ben Wallace, the security minister, has been talking about the fact that um, new laws are coming in in months. Jihadists could face up to 10 years in jail if they return to Britain. And also, just as a final thought, Gina, would she be useful for those who are exploring the reasons for radicalisation? Mm. Well, firstly, when it comes to um, any charges that could be um, put on her when she comes back, it's very difficult, um, particularly due to the security constraints and access issues, to try and gain um, hard evidence that can convict her of any crimes whilst being in Islamic State territory. So there's a difficult with a threshold um, of evidence to convict her for any uh, crimes to support terrorists terrorism. Um, When it comes to her being a model uh, upon return, it's very interesting to have a female perspective on this. And in many cases, uh, when we speak to former radicals or extremists, it's very much um, a male narrative of their radicalization process. So there are definitely lessons to be learned, but whether she would be in a position to willingly cooperate and disengage. Just finally, your research fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalization, Mm -hmm. she's in front of you What's your number one question to her? I would ask her what the tipping point was for her to leave. It's one thing for her and her friends to discuss what they're seeing online, whether that's propaganda videos, whether that is um, tweets or Facebook posts from others who are out there. But then there's the tipping point where you go from someone who is theoretically engaged to then active mobilization for her to travel across international borders and make that journey as a minor. So I would ask what exactly was her, was her tipping point for her and her friends to make that decision. Thank you very much, Gina Vale, as I say. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Research Fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College London. OK, let's go to Terry in London and Pat in Maidenhead. Good morning, Pat. Hi, Terry. We'll speak to an expert on this. Hello. Not that you all aren't, uh, but we've got a senior research fellow for the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at King's College London, Charlie Winter, to speak to in just a moment. Are you all right, Charlie? Yeah, very well, thank you. So, Pat, are you, can you muster any sympathy? Um, very little, in fact. My, my initial wish is that uh, she didn't return, but actually... Uh, if people commit serious crimes and they're foreign nationals here, they get sent back if they got a prison sentence of more than a few years. So my initial thoughts are is that, yes, bring her back into the country with the child, but then actually separate the two. One is put the girl on trial for... Uh, the crime she supposedly uh, committed. Um, but clearly, from the things she says in this, no, I, I'm not fazed by a beheaded head in a basket. And she's admitting killing or assisting the torture of non-Muslims for the sake of religion and nothing else. She's clearly not well balanced, I would say mentally disturbed. So I would then say, in addition to the trial, get her assessed medically to see what Uh, assistance can be done in terms of mental health but actually the child separate the child or the baby to be born from the mother we do that in this country when parents or one of the parents is mentally unwell and unable to look after the child so separate the child bring that child up in a foster care or something similar um, and then go go from there but for the future 
she has to be watched for a long, long period of time if she does go through mental rehabilitation, etc. Because it's a bit like a drug addict. You can be off it for years, but then you can snap back into what um, you originally liked and enjoyed and all the rest of it. And I wouldn't trust her forever. So I wouldn't be surprised if she was locked up for a long period of time. Depends what crime they can find. Yeah, we heard Ben Wallace earlier on. Yeah, Terry, do you want to come in here? No, I do, Nicky. Morning. What's the best, uh, Terry, what's the best argument for her coming home? I have no argument for her coming home. The, bro the brass nick of the woman, she should stay where she is. I can understand maybe the child, when born, being brought back, maybe looked after by her family or social services. Child's got no thought of the child, unborn child. She's not remorseful. Listening to that interview this morning, uh, unbelievable. She, was she any inducements by the time to give us some money for the interview? No, no, no suggestion of that whatsoever. She'll, she'll come, the inducement come is for her to actually set her case out, and she did so rather well, badly because she didn't... Yeah, there, well, that's the no point. That's remorse. the point. Nikki, she'll come back here. She'll get somewhere to live. Why should we have to pay to watch her for God knows how many years? Newspapers will fall at their feet to pay for her story. Her family will want paying for their story. She'll be fated in some circles to chatter in classes as a victim. You know, absolute disgrace. Stay where she is. If I have sympathy, her unborn child should be allowed to uh, grow up here. No fault of his or her own. But for her, the brass neck, majority of the country yeah. don't want her here, but she wants to come back. No, I, I have no sympathy uh, for her, but I, I feel that there is an obligation in this country to actually deal with your own mess and this is a mess and uh, you, you can't just leave it elsewhere i'd like to i'd honestly like to but you can't leave it else you have to bring it back and sort it out and um it, it'll cost she but in the grand scheme she isn't our responsibility charlie winter is she british uh, yeah, I think she is British. And so I, then we I, have, I, do we have as a nation she gave an obligation? Right hang on, British. hang on. She gave up the right. Let's, well, okay, he says we gave up the right, but technically, if she is British still, if she hasn't, you know, had her passport rescinded or a nationality taken away or whatever because of all this, do we technically have an obligation to allow her back into the country if she is a British citizen? <sighs> Charlie Winter. We do. I mean, it's a, a, a legal obligation to allow her back. And I completely agree with the, the first speaker and indeed the second speaker. It's not an ideal situation at all. I think that based on this interview, she seems disillusioned with the recent reality of living in the Islamic State, but she doesn't seem disillusioned with the idea and the ideals behind it, which suggests that she's kind of by definition disengaged from the group now, but not necessarily de-radicalized, which is problematic. And obviously the relevant counter-terrorism authorities will have to evaluate what threat she actually presents, potentially presents uh, upon her return. But we do have a legal obligation because she still is a British citizen. There are certain uh, circumstances in which citizenship can be uh, revoked, but that is not the case in this one. What would that... she be charged with? Well, it depends completely on what she has found out to have participated in. So she speaks in the interview about normal life in the Islamic State. Normal life could be just living at home, having kids, but also normal life in the Islamic State could be uh, participating in the enslavement of Yazidi sex slaves. It could be uh, participating in acts of violence. It could be supporting acts of violence. I mean, normal life is a very uh, vague definition of what she <laughs> was doing. The other thing is that, of course, kind of the conventional wisdom among jihadi organizations is that women are not really meant to fight at all. But in 2017, 2018, the Islamic State actually shifted its position on that. So there is a chance that she will have received some sort of uh, training as well, which the security minister alluded to when he was responding to this earlier today. Who's Gemma? I'll bring you back in, Terry. I know <laughs> that you have more to say. Let me bring some other people in as well. Gemma in Manchester. Hi. Good morning, Gemma. And Nav in Bradford. Hello, Nav. Hello, Nikki. Good morning. What are you thinking, Nav? So my initial view, um, when I heard this story break last night, initially several years ago when it was the first, the story was first uh, surfaced, I had um, a, um, sympathies for her because at the time, legally, she was a child under the age of 16. 
And so I was of the view that she, well, all of us, as a general point, we're all a product of our conditioned thinking. So by definition, she'll have been a product of uh, being indoctrinated because to hold such views or to carry out such actions to, to go to Syria, as she did, uh, it would suggest that she's been indoctrinated or probably over a sustained period of time. It's not something which you develop overnight. However, the key thing is this, that she's had time now for self-introspection because she's in a refugee camp, so she's in a, in a quite kind of destitute position, and that allows time for self-awareness and self-reflection. Self-refle- and even given that opportunity, she's still not contrite, which then by definition you could say that she's still in a radicalised state. So if she does come back, that's extra resources to kind of de-radicalise her. Um, so in, in one sense, it's good that she's still being honest in saying what her position is, because then we know what the current state of affairs is, and that she's not lying and trying to say that now she's showing contrition and then it could be a false state of contrition so we know exactly how she feels which is a good thing it allows it to allows the, the, the authorities to, to to carefully monitor her when she comes back or also put her on trial maybe um so it's a, it's a difficult one because she went as a child and she's coming back as an adult so because she went as a child there is something there that shows that she was radicalised. and She says she doesn't hold out high hopes for IS, which means and there's lots in the interview which leads us to very firmly conclude she believes in IS. She thinks that IS was undermined by corruption, which is um, not exactly an unequivocal condemnation of the uh, religion. Sorry, who's that? It's, it's Charlie, Nick. I was just going to add that also when she is referring to uh, the beheaded heads in a bin she speaks about them as having belonged to an enemy of islam yeah, and yeah. i mean that that when when i saw that i was like mm, i mean it's pretty clear that she is disgusting. not disgusting absolutely yeah. Disgusting. yeah hang on terry I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm holding you just for a minute I've, the stable door is locked but i'm going to open it <laughs> in just uh, one second Gemma, um nav makes some interesting points are you there Gemma? hi yeah if um... you were her what would you have said? If you were her, wanted to come back, would you have said, well, you know, these were the enemies of Islam. Well, you know, I believe in Islamic State. Well, I saw these severed heads, but I wasn't phased by it. Would you have said that stuff? <laughs> Probably not, but I've not been, I've not been radicalised. Like, she was radicalised. She went over when she was 15. She's still only 19. Do you feel sorry for her? I do, I, I do feel sorry for her, although I have to say, like, I don't, I don't agree with the ideology or anything at all, but if she is pregnant, nine months pregnant, she's already watched two babies, uh, her, her own two babies die, she's in a um, refugee camp with, I think, I mean, I've only read the BBC coverage of it, I haven't actually read the Times article about it, but I think she said, like, they're, they're one of 39,000 refugees in that camp. I do. I feel. I do feel sorry for her. Just, just as a, as a, um, as a, someone who's carried two babies and you know been fortunate enough to have them in um, NHS hospitals, which were wonderful care, and that was difficult enough. I can't imagine being a lone woman. I think. I think I read in the coverage that her husband's dead, or she doesn't. She's definitely separated away from him. Um, I, I, I do I, I, that part of me as a mum. I can't. I can't not feel compassionate to, towards her. Interesting. Yeah. This but is... I don't agree the, with the ideology. Of course not. I have to say that uh, I think. Of course the, not. Yeah. I think the, um, the the headlines that are being used in this are really inflammatory. Like and what? They're to, get, they're to get us all riled up and say, well, it's ridiculous. Well, it's quite inflammatory if you say that you saw severed heads, it didn't really phase you, and it's quite it inflammatory. Is, but, but to, the, the, the stuff she said was quite inflammatory, wasn't it? I know, but she was being interviewed by a skilled uh, journalist who wants to get the biggest possible story, you know, potentially of the year. We asked her some pretty straight questions. I didn't hear any particular journalistic chicanery going on. Did you see executions? No, I didn't. But I did see severed heads. What did you think of that? Didn't particularly faze me. They were enemies of Islam. Yeah, like mm. I know, like it's not doing her any favours. I'm like I totally agree with that. But, but as um, as a as a compassionate country, we should be thinking about that child. Yeah, I I, I think so. Yeah. I, I do think so. Yeah. Mm. Do you think of the David? has sent a tweet to Five Live and he says avid listener to Five Live but I'm going to give it a miss this morning the hang em flog em brigade forget she was 15 when she went a child and radicalised here 
She's our problem. The show is just pandering to vile bile today. Not in your case, Gemma. You're, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're setting out what a rational point of view and a rational argument that, you know, beyond the anger, which is entirely understandable, completely justifiable, this, this thug regime, this sadistic caliphate. Um, there's a baby there, Terry. Terry, on, yeah, there's a baby yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, a British yeah, baby yeah, about to be born. I know, and I feel very sorry for that baby to have such a thing as a mother. Um, when, when she went out there, was it her two sisters, the two other girls? They were grade-A students. They weren't stupid girls. They were clever girls, grade-A students. I, I didn't even sense uh, remorse on the, on the two children that she had lost. I said, no remorse there either. Where were they buried, them two children? You know, um, I just I just can't... When she comes back here, it's a, where, where's she going to live? How's, how's this going to work? Uh, uh, right, she goes to trial for being a member of ISIS. And when she, when she says what she's seen and what she hasn't seen, do we believe a word she says? She may well have seen... Um, beheading, she may well have been part of it. Well, Gemma, the other thing is, of course, which is a point that has been made. I mean, I'll put this to Charlie, Charlie Winter. Yeah. Radicalisation expert. And I asked this yeah. of one of your colleagues earlier on. If you were in a room with her, what would be your number one question to her? I would be interested to know what it was that happened in the last few weeks that made her leave now as opposed to at another time. The mm -hmm. decline of the Islamic State has been pretty steadily happening since mid-2016, I'd say. Yeah. With uh, the loss of Mosul, the loss of Raqqa, the, the, the journey that she took down the Euphrates towards uh, Baghouz, the, the, this last holdout now, is fairly typical of a lot of foreign fighters. And there's a lot of foreign fighters, surprising number of foreign fighters, I think, to lots of the agencies involved in, in trying to, to deal with them after they've left these territories in this pocket of territory. Now, it, it has been inevitable that the Islamic State was going to be defeated. And within its own propaganda as well, it has alluded to the fact that the, the physical, the territorial caliphate um, was on its way out. So I am interested to know what it was that made her stay until this point. Because, yes, the fighting is particularly intense right now, but it's been pretty intense uh, for much of the last two years, three okay, years Okay, listen, the other thing is, just quickly, Senior Research Fellow for the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation. How valuable might she be in informing that study? Well... I mean, valuable in, in lots of different ways. Uh, it depends, of course, what kind of... Th I mean, it, to be honest, it would be very uh, unlikely that an academic uh, institution would have any chance to, to speak with her. But for authorities who are trying to better understand this issue, uh, law enforcement and so on, she could be a val very valuable source, depending on if she's willing to, to come up with any information. But, I mean first on the, the radicalization side of things, her own story of radicalization, how she radicalized and the network of people that were around her that also went to join the Islamic State uh, those years ago. How did that work? So naming, work? naming names might be an interesting uh, aspect. Not potentially naming names, but also understanding, better understanding the psychosocial phenomenon that led to that in the okay. first place. All right. Um, John in Shrewsbury, Sal in London. Hi, John. Morning, Sal. Sal, how are you? Good morning. Sal, I believe, is, am I right in saying you're a Muslim? That's right. No, I'm, I'm Johnny Muslim. No, Johnny Shrewsbury. Sal I'm talking to. Hello, Sal. Hi, Nicky. Yeah, what do you think, Sal? Well, my point is, um, clearly she's in a refugee camp with thousands of women <coughs> um, uh, and children as well. So what about them? You know, what about all those women who are, uh, uh, and, and uh, got little children and may be pregnant as well? Um, just because she's a British citizen, um, you know, she clearly um, made, made the wrong choices. And right. um, therefore she needs to, you know, um, like they say, you live by the decisions that you, you make sort of thing. Mm. Have you got any sympathy? Um, I've got sympathy for the unborn child. Yeah. Um, clearly, because, um, and maybe, you know, something around the unborn child 
um, like we do in this country when you know they're abusive parents or drug addicts, etc., and how they're taken away. But again, you know, that's not for me to sort of uh, decide, sort of thing. No. Uh, but, but the other point that, that I'd like to make is that um, the Muslim community have been working for a number of years um, trying to get this message across to young people yeah. to say, listen, you know, um, uh, this is not for us. It's now not our religion. Um, and then you know they go go away and, and and do this, and now expect to come back to the country. She's made her choice. Yeah, she's made her choice. John, am I right in saying you used to be a youth worker in Tower Hamlets, from where these schoolgirls came and went? Yes, to... I did actually. Yeah. I mean, I don't know the family, but I've worked quite quite a lot with the Bangladeshi community, which she's from, and I've also been to Bangladesh a few times. I think it's a very difficult one to deal with. But I do think it will show the world if we in England can be a bit different. Yes, I think the interview with the Times, as someone's already said, was a very skillful interview, and she her answers are appalling and not very satisfying at all. But of course, she could have lied and said she's changed. I do think we've got to show another way that we allow this lady back under supervision. She's no doubt got family members. She will have family members, aunties, uncles in Tower Hamlets and Bethnal Green who will want her back and are against all these sort of things. I met very few in my time as a youth worker there and a youth officer, very few people who were in favour of anything like this and would completely be behind the British way of life. So I think we have to show an, another way of doing this, allow her back under supervision, and as someone's already said, Nick, we could um, learn from her why do people get so radicalizations? It's happening, and we need to work on it and find a way forward. OK, listen, Jade in Mansfield, do you have any sympathy, Jade? No, not at all, and I think... Um... I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but you know that um, photographer that got shot? I bet his family want him back as well, but they can't have him back because I have killed it. It's annoying me that people are referring to it as a child at 15. I knew at 15 what was right and wrong. I wouldn't have gone over to a foreign country. For a start, I wouldn't have had the funds. Where she got the funds from? And it's... I just... She's not shown any remorse. The only thing that she's angry about is that they were killing other Muslims. She hasn't got any remorse at all. And there was James Foley, as you say, and there were many others as well who will never be able to come back. Their families want them back, yeah. And another thing that annoys me is this this word, radicalisation, if things don't just fall onto my laptop, I have to make a choice to engage with them. Is it a form of grooming, Charlie Winter? There is uh, a fair bit of research that tries to look at it through that perspective. It sometimes is a form of grooming, sometimes it isn't. In the context of the Islamic State, it, it, it's perhaps less a form of grooming uh, than the traditional uh, way of looking at radicalization, wherein you'd have typically someone who would be um, playing the role of recruiter, as it were. So someone who is an extremist themselves and then spends a lot of time with uh, an individual or group of individuals trying to draw them into the ideology. In the case of the Islamic State, what we actually saw was a lot of young people being recruited in networks. And they weren't being recruited by older people uh, or kind of official recruiters of the Islamic State. They were being recruited by other peers who had gone over there and then basically reached out to them from Syria to say come on over. It's like it, it looks in the propaganda. It's, it's, it's performing jihad in the way that it says it's performing jihad. So it's, it's not a clear-cut thing. I would say, though, that the, the term radicalization, obviously it's a, a catch-all phrase, but it does speak about a process, not just an immediate switch on, switch off. It's very, very rare that anyone radicalizes in a short period of time. There's a, a whole set of different processes that lead up to it that can be impacted by lots of different things. And while we understand it better than we did, say, 20 years ago, it's still a really, really complex thing to try to get our heads around and Thank you. try to get policy to, to challenge. Thank you very much, Charlie Winter. Likewise, all our callers, many more to come. Let's hear what you think. Can you muster any sympathy for this uh, woman?